Uh, from quite a few people on the scene, we've been told that the powder uh, it represented most of the concrete, that the amount of intact macroscopic chunks of concrete on the scene were, were negligible, that basically everything was reduced to powder. And incidentally, we also know that other things besides concrete were reduced to powder. We know that contents of computers, exotic metals from computer chips, these sorts of things were, were also identified in the dust and in very small particles, uh, generally on the order of less than 100 microns in diameter. So we have a real issue of mechanism as far as what in the, in the process of this collapse could cause so many things to be pulverized so finely. For the, the towers to collapse the way we saw them collapse basically implies that the columns simply collapsed into themselves. They telescoped straight down. Uh, steel keeps a lot of its structural integrity, uh, even, even when heated, until you begin to approach the melting point, you, you don't really see a catastrophic loss of strength. And this is what we're talking about. We're talking about basically vertical box columns collapsing into themselves, which implies a complete loss of mechanical strength. And as far as the initial impacts, this recent uh, NIST study made an interesting point about World Trade Centers uh, two. Uh, the film analysis showed that, that it oscillated for about four minutes after it was struck by the airplane, and the oscillation rate was identical to what would be expected for the intact tower. Trade Center towers and most modern buildings are heavily redundant in the sense that uh, the load bearing can be shifted to other members if some of them fail, and we, we saw that happen in this case. Stresses do redistribute, but Absent further weakening of the structural members, that distribution is, is limited. It, it happens, the, the structure restabilizes, and unless there's significant further damage, it doesn't progress to a total collapse. World Trade One began collapsing from the very top after an hour and 40 minutes. Uh, it's very hard to imagine office contents progressively heating up high, hotter and hotter over that period of time. And for a building to collapse from the very top, which is the least heavily loaded, is also very odd, to say the least. Uh, just a couple of other anomalies. As we know, there were reports of explosions. There were reports of underground explosions in both of the towers at the time of the impact from a building engineer by the name of Philip Morelli. There are interviews with him on the web. Uh, from the Noday Brothers film, 9-11, we see that the lobby of the North Tower was extensively damaged with what looks like high explosive blast damage, and this was immediately after the plane collision. But uh, we know that on the weekend before, there were power downs, and there appear to have been evacuation drills going on throughout the, the previous week, uh, which suggests that uh, at least some people knew that, uh, that something was happening. The power downs may represent a time window in which demolition charges would have been planted, although I, I think it's possible that uh, they also were, were planted over a much longer period of time, uh, given the relative accessibility of the buildings. Okay, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff King. Thank you very, very much. A common explanation as to why no U.S. military interceptors took to the skies on September 11th until it was too late is that it was simple incompetence. Well, let me deal with the incompetence theory. First, by taking you back to October 26, 1999. That is the day the chartered Learjet carrying golfer Payne Stewart crashes, killing all on board. This from the National Transportation Safety Board crash report. 9.19 a.m., the flight departs. 9.24, the Learjet's pilot responds to an instruction from air traffic control. 9.33, the controller radios another instruction. No response from the pilot. For four and a half minutes, the controller tries to establish contact. Having failed, the controller calls in the military. Note that he did not seek, nor did he require, the approval of the President of the United States, or indeed anyone. Its standard procedure followed routinely to call in the Air Force when radio contact with a commercial passenger jet is lost, or the plane departs from its flight path, or anything along those lines occurs. 
9.54, 16 minutes later, the F-16 reaches the Learjet at 46,000 feet and conducts a visual inspection. Total elapsed time, 21 minutes. So what does this prove? Well, it proves that standing routines exist for dealing with all such emergencies. For instance, loss of radio contact. All personnel in the air and on the ground are trained to follow the routines, which have been fine-tuned over decades, as the Learjet incident illustrates. For large scheduled aircraft tracked throughout on radar to depart extravagantly from their flight paths would trigger numerous calls to the military, especially after two have hit the World Trade Center and now one is speeding toward Washington, D.C. It flies over the White House, turns sharply and heads toward the Pentagon. Everyone, and I mean everyone, now knows these planes are very bad news. It's been reported on all TV networks for more than half an hour that this is a terrorist attack. Now, Andrews Air Force Base is a huge installation. It's home to Air Force One, the President's plane. It's home base for two combat-ready squadrons of jet interceptors, mandated to ensure the safety of the U.S. Capitol. Andrews is only 12 miles from the White House. On September 11th, the squadrons there are the 121st Fighter Squadron of the 113th Fighter Wing, equipped with F-16s, and the 321st Marine Fighter Attack Squadron of the 49th Marine Air Group, Detachment A, equipped with F-A-18s. This information was on the website of the base on September 11th. On September 12th, Andrews chose to update its website. I find it odd that after the update, there's no mention of the F-16 and F-18 fighters. The base becomes, according to the website, home to a transport squadron only. Yet at 6.30 the evening of September 11th, NBC Nightly News, along with many outlets, reported, it was after the attack on the Pentagon that the Air Force then decided to scramble F-16s out of the D.C. National Guard Andrews Air Force Base to fly a protective cover over Washington, D.C. Throughout the northeastern United States are many air bases. But that morning, no interceptors respond in a timely fashion to the highest alert situation. This includes the Andrews squadrons, which have the longest lead time and are 12 miles from the White House. Whatever the explanation for the huge failure, there have been no reports, to my knowledge, of reprimands. This further weakens the incompetence theory. Incompetence usually earns reprimands. This causes me to ask, and other media need to ask, if there were stand-down orders. The events of 9-11 begin with aircraft going wildly off course. Incredibly, despite radar tracking for almost two hours, the whole of the mighty U.S. Air Force goes AWOL that morning. It's a mind-bending anomaly. Not a single U.S. Air Force interceptor turns a wheel until it's too late. There are no jets at all. It's a matter of historical record. That could happen only two ways. Either it was staggering multiple simultaneous coincidental incompetence at all levels in many agencies defying known laws of averages, a 54 million to one chance, which is the 9-11 Commission official story. There's another explanation. The U.S. Air Force is neutralized by design. The evidence indicates this is about a one-to-one -one chance. Michael Rupert, a former Los Angeles Police Department detective, was the first major 9-11 skeptic and researcher in the world and remains one of the foremost. He was one of 40 experts on 9-11 who testified at the six-day International Citizens' Inquiry into 9-11 held in Toronto in May of 2004. I helped organize that event. At the inquiry, Michael Rupert addresses the absence of jet interceptors, but the unlikelihood of a simple stand-down order and asks, what if they were so confused and had been so deliberately confused that they couldn't respond? Michael Rupert is standing by at his office in Sherman Oaks, California. Michael, thanks for this. 